Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to be able to introduce the 43rd President of the United States, George Walker Bush. Thank you all. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, Michael, before we begin, I do want to thank Eduardo for his leadership of the uh, Miami Community College. I had the honor of giving the graduation speech here when I was the president, and uh, I am thankful that you've invited me back. Uh, Mitch, I also want to thank you for promoting literacy. As a new author, it's in my interest that you promote literacy. <laughs> I want you to know I did recognize the fact that you have invited my mother, my wife, our daughter, and you finally got to me. <laughs> and finally, I want to thank you all for buying uh, this book, which I personally signed. And uh, I understand after this is over, you'll get your copy, and I'm grateful. Well, Mr. President, your book is entitled Decision Points. It's not really an exhaustive autobiography of your full life or the full part of your presidency. Tell us what you w wanted to do with this book. I thought it'd be kind of strange to start off, I was born in a log cabin. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't exactly the case. Uh, I wanted to, uh, Michael, I wanted people to understand what it was like to be president during a consequential time. I made a lot of controversial decisions, and uh, I wanted to give the reader a chance to understand the process by which I made decisions, uh, the environment in which I made decisions, the people I listened to as I made decisions. And um, I, 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 this is not an attempt to uh, rewrite history. It's not an attempt to fashion a legacy. It is an attempt to be a part of the historical narrative. And uh, it, it was a, a joyous experience to write it. There is, a, there is an autobiographical portion. Uh, and I have put that in there to try to make the first decision of the book, was why I run for president in the first place, a, uh, a logical um, uh, decision for the reader. In other words, I couldn't just say I decided to run without describing the person who was running. And so the book starts off with, can you tell me a day in which you haven't had a drink? And it's the beginning of me quitting drinking. And I will tell you, uh, I, I wouldn't be sitting here as a former president had I not quit drinking. Who, who's, who's asked you that question? Believe it or not, it was my dear wife, Laura. <laughs> she was obviously tired of me drinking. And, uh, and uh, as the reader will learn, I became tired of me drinking as well. Uh, it, the book is very anecdotal. Uh, and, um, uh, and it was uh, really an interesting experience to recreate the anecdotes. It turns out the president has got a lot of... Uh, historical records at his disposal. So uh, there's diaries for every minute of my life as president. Uh, there are uh, notes of uh, national security meetings. There are uh, memorandum of, of, of phone calls I made. And it was interesting to recreate a lot of the decision-making process from the historical records. But of course, nobody could, there's no historical record of how I felt or uh, the emotions I felt. And I try to do my best to give the reader that sense of uh, emotions during some of the very traumatic moments. Your father was elected president in 1988. Um, as a future president, you might have had a lot of opportunity for training at that point, but what kind of a role did you play? What observations did you make in, in your dad's campaign and his administration? Uh, the, that's, uh, well, first of all, uh, obviously a focal point of the early part of the book is my relationship with my father. And uh, I, I recognize there's a lot of psycho babble that was taking place during my presidency about the relationship between father and son, both of whom were presidents. Uh, the story is pretty simple. I love George Bush. I adore George Bush. And he was an incredible inspiration for me. And um, I, I learned a lot from him, obviously, as an observer. Uh, I learned uh, structure in a White House. Now, I never dreamt I was going to be president when he ran in 1988. Uh, 
Very few people dreamt I was going to be president. When... <laughs> yes, I, I remember interviewing including you. Including my mother. <laughs> <laughs> including you. <laughs> I remember interviewing you in the Texas delegation with Governor Clements and That's other right. people at the Republican National Yeah, you Convention. weren't saying I'm interviewing a future president. You're... Well, I thought Governor Clements might make it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you were just saying, I hope the boy stays out of trouble. <laughs> well. But I, yeah, but I, I, here's what I learned. I learned, uh, I learned, I, I watched a gracious man be president. What's interesting uh, is Watching my dad be president was a lot harder than being president. In other words, when people, I, I love to get to the point when somebody say anything bad about him, I would get angry. And frankly, at times, I was rude and say so in the book. Because I was defending somebody that meant a lot to me. And so when I became president, it was much easier to deal with the slings and arrows of the presidency, having watched him go through it. And, and people say, oh, didn't the name calling bother you? Not really. It bothered me for my dad. It really didn't bother me for me, and I, and I make that point in the book. Tell us about the first time you pushed Dick Cheney for vice president. Well, uh, he's referring to a story in the book where uh, I had made up my mind that uh, Dick Cheney was the right person to run with me. Just so you know, the vice presidential selection process is really the first indication as to how a potential president will make a decision. And I had watched my dad uh, make his decision, and it was a very thoughtful process. And I asked Dick Cheney to be the person to lead the process. The vice presidential pick also ought to say clearly to the American people that the future president or a potential president understands the most important role of the vice president is to succeed the president if something bad happens. And so after going through the exhaustive list, list with Dick, I decided that he would be the right vice presidential pick. I, I liked him. I trusted his judgment. I knew he wouldn't be the kind of person that would be constantly second-guessing decisions. And uh, he could be president. And it would reassure the American people that I understood the nature of the vice presidency. And so uh, I told my, my senior team down there in Austin about it, and Karl Rove strongly objected. Uh, he didn't think... Uh, he, he thought that Vice President Cheney would... Uh, not help us with the Electoral College. It turned out the three electoral votes in Wyoming were really valuable. He, uh, he, 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 felt like, he felt like picking someone from my father's administration would look too much like, uh, you know, a continuation of, of President 41's administration. He was worried about his health, and he was worried about uh, some of the policies that Dick had voted on when he was in the U.S. Congress. And, and so my management style was that... Uh, uh, to put Carl and Dick in the same room at the governor's mansion in Austin and let Carl air out why uh, he didn't think Dick ought to be on the ticket. What's interesting is that Dick agreed with him. <laughs> and so it took me a while to persuade uh, Vice President Cheney to be, join us on the ticket. Uh, he, you know, there's a lot of speculation about my relationship with him. I will tell you this, that I'm glad I picked him in 2000. And as I sit here in 2010, uh, I'm glad I picked him. Uh, in 2000, and uh, he was, a, in my judgment, a superb vice president. Uh, a couple of people that were not eager for you to run for president in 1999 and 2000 were two people very closely related to you, and they, there's some connection there with what you state as your biggest mistake in the 2000 campaign, or biggest right. mistake with respect to the 2000 Well, I, you're referring to my daughters. Yeah. Uh, you can understand why. They just uh, were graduated from Austin High School, and the idea of their father running and winning, and they go to college with Secret Service, was just really not appealing to them. And uh, uh, Michael's referring to the biggest political mistake of my life was uh, not revealing to the people of Texas that I had been arrested for drunk driving. I had been up in Maine, and John Newcomb and I went to a bar, and he taught me how to drink beer out of a mug with no hands, <laughs> which means you bite the edge of the mug and you, <laughs> and I had too much to drink and was pulled over by a policeman in Kennebunkport, Maine, paid the fine, did what I was supposed to do. I had been called for jury duty in Austin, now as governor, and it was a drunken driving charge. I'd been dismissed from the jury. But as I was walking out of the courtroom, a reporter said, have you ever been arrested for drunk driving? 
uh, I uh, said I'd done a lot of stupid things when I was young. And that's all I said. And here's the reason. My girls were fixing to drive. And I felt strongly that baby boomer parents should not be visiting their sins upon their children. And I was deeply concerned that if I'd have said yes, that my message to them would have been undermined. They said, oh, he's just saying it. After all, he became the governor. I think we will drink and drive as well. And it was a huge political mistake. Because five days before the election in 2000, the sealed records were unsealed and dropped uh, in the public arena. That was an easy issue to handle. Of course, I'd have been arrested, but guess what? I quit drinking. But the problem is anything that changes the discourse with five days to go in a campaign is monumental. And Carl and I believe that that revelation of the drunken driving probably cost two million votes. As people say, wait a minute, we don't need this. You know, we thought he was one way and he's another. They didn't really spend time discerning uh, the issue. It just, there was a, a reaction. And it was a huge political mistake. If I had to do it over again, I obviously would have revealed at the appropriate time that I had been uh, drinking and driving. I had paid my dues. I had quit drinking and probably should have held the event at a Mothers Against Drunk Driving seminar. Um, the, we're here speaking in Florida. Did you think you were, was there any point where you thought you might not get Florida's electoral votes in that uh, 2000 controversy? It seemed like we had to win the race five different times, but uh, I, uh, you know, I wasn't sure that, you know, when I think about Florida, there's one thing that really does, does irritate me, and that was the, and I put this in the book in, in a rather gentle way, but the networks called the election in Florida before the West, the panhandle of Florida had closed their polls, and I, I'm confident it cost me a lot of votes. People, a lot of Americans don't understand, but most of Florida's on the eastern time zone, but the panhandle's out there in the central time zone. And so when they call the election at 7 o'clock eastern, there's a lot of people who say, well, it's over. No need for me to go vote. But it was a very traumatic time. Uh, I am most grateful for one of my early decisions, and that was on election day. A couple of things. One, uh, people were urging me to go to Claire Victory, and, and Brother Jeb uh, took me aside and said, don't do it. And his judgment was right. Uh, secondly, um, I woke up really early in the morning and uh, uh, asked Jimmy Baker to come down here, my dad's dear friend and one of the great public servants ever, and, and it worked out fine. But it was, uh, it was an interesting period. The, uh, as president, you met and dealt with many foreign leaders. You write about at least some of them in the book uh, in varying shapes and forms. You write, I have always been able to read people. Um, Vladimir Putin, you know, when you first met him, you said you, you got a sense of his soul. Uh, but you I looked later, in his eyes and saw his soul. And later you, you, you told him he was cold-blooded. Yeah, I did. And did you read him wrong? Did he change? What, what can you tell us well, about first, Vladimir Well, first let me tell Putin? you the story. 